So um, I'm doing it via Zoom, which is great. I'll be recording this and then emailing it out next week, all being well, so you can have another look at it if you want to. Um, by default, I've just muted everybody just to keep background noise because I know we're all homeschooling and lots of kids running around at the moment. But if you do need to ask a question at any time, just unmute yourself. Um, I've scheduled this for an hour and we'll just see how long it takes. Whenever I do in-person workshops, obviously there's lots of discussion um, and lots of questions, which will be um, possibly less when we're doing it via Zoom, but we'll just see. So I'll get started and I'll just explain who I am because I don't know any of you ladies, so um, I'm not sure how much you know about me, but my name is Lisa. Uh, as you can tell, I'm originally Irish, hence the accent, but I've been in Australia for like nearly 20 years. I just haven't lost my accent. And I'm a holistic nutritionist and a feeding therapist and also a GAPS practitioner. So the GAPS diet is a diet, a very intense gut healing diet that's really great for lots of different conditions, both physical health and mental health. And I'm also doing my degree in naturopathy. So hopefully all being well by the end of this year, I'll be um, a qualified naturopath too. And I'm all about getting to the root cause of disease. So in our society, we, we go for um, addressing the symptoms a lot of the time, but really when we mask symptoms of anything, we miss what our body is trying to tell us. And if we actually dig a bit deeper and ask the five why, so why, 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 um, you can often get to the root cause. And when you can address the root cause, then you can fix problems more easily. My focus is on kids, but I also work with um, adults and entire families on their health. And originally before this, actually my degree is in mechanical and food engineering, which is like 25 years ago. That's what I decided I was going to be. Um, but then I worked as a food scientist for you know 12 years in the food industry in processed food. So not a sort of food that I recommend to anybody. And before I get on to the agenda and exactly what we're going to be talking about today, I'm just going to talk about a few myths because these myths really get in the way of healthy eating and they get in the way of addressing um, fussy eaters issues. So the first myth is that eating is your body's number one priority. And that's not actually true. Breathing is your body's number one priority and not falling over is your body's second priority. So actually just staying in the upright position is your body's second priority. So eating comes down number three, which leads on to myth number two, that eating is instinctive. And you often hear this, you know, they'll eat if they're hungry. Um, but that's not actually true either, except for in the first four to six weeks of life. So with newborns, um, obviously they, they come out of their mother's tummy and they have that rooting instinct to get to the nipple and that's eating is instinctive in those six weeks but after that it's not instinctive anymore. And the third myth is that eating is easy um, and why would you have to learn how to eat but it's actually really really tricky and really really complex as we'll talk about today and this slide just um, explains all the different things that need to come together nicely for somebody to be able to feed successfully. So all your organs are involved, all your muscles, not just the muscles in your mouth to chew, but the muscles to hold the spoon, the muscles to keep you upright and to keep you in a seated position. All your senses, so touching the food, smelling the food, tasting the food, seeing the food, they all come into play your nutritional status, which we'll talk about in a moment, your learning style um, and your capacity to learn new skills, your stage of development and the environment that you're in. So all of these things come together to be um, a successful eater. And if one of these, if you have an issue in one of these areas, then the whole thing can fall apart quite easily. So this is the agenda of what we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to be talking about the underlying causes of picky eating. Um, we're going to be 
talking about what the difference is between a picky eater and a problem eater, because there's lots and lots of, of picky eaters, but it doesn't really, it's not a problem. But then there's the children where it becomes a real problem because they're not gaining weight or various different reasons. We're going to talk about sort of general strategies that you can implement to address your um, picky eaters or problem eaters. We're going to talk about food jags, which might be a term that you haven't heard before. I will talk about that in great detail because I find that super interesting. And when I learned about food jags, it, it made a lot of sense in all the clients that I had seen that had picky eating problems. Um, and then we're going to talk about SOS feeding therapy um, when it's appropriate and how does it work? Because that's the, um, the type of feeding therapy that I am trained in. And we'll talk about the different types of feeding therapies that there are and you know why I'm trained in SOS and why it works. So the underlying causes. So these are sort of the four main underlying causes of picky eating. The first one is zinc deficiency. And I'm extremely passionate about this one, which may sound like a strange thing to be passionate about, but um, in my clinic, I deal with a lot of children with behavioral issues, um, lots of ADHD, lots of autism, lots of oppositional defiance disorder, and zinc deficiency is a very strong theme that comes through with a lot of children. And it also affects your sense of taste and your appetite and how you digest food. So if you're deficient in zinc, you're not going to want to eat. And by not wanting to eat, it makes your zinc deficiency worse. So that's a whole vicious cycle that is really, really easy for children to get into. Uh, sorry, can I just stop you there, Vanessa? Yep. Um, yep. Zinc deficiency, um, oh, is that, yeah, yeah. that because you're, you're saying behaviour oh, yeah. issues yeah. as well? Um, could that be done by, um, like, could that be certified by having, like, um, tablets, like, like a way of ingesting zinc, like having tablets or something? Yeah, yeah. So definitely, if your child is deficient in zinc, um, and you can do a hair test to find out if they are. Um, okay. There's also clues. I've actually got a really good example of what a zinc deficiency is, which is not good. But can you see my fingernail? Um, hang on, I'm just on the other page. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So you see those white spots? Yes, yeah. If, if your child, I only have that on one nail, so I don't know what happened, but it's only on one nail. Okay. But if your child's fingernails all look like that, and even their toenails, that's a really good clue that they're deficient in zinc, or okay. if they've got lots of skin issues, and ADHD is another sign of zinc deficiency. But yes, you can take a supplement to address that, and that's oh, what I, I yeah. Um, the next thing is out of balance gut bacteria. So especially if your child has an overgrowth of candida, which you may know as thrush or a yeast infection, that candida will persuade your child to make poor food choices. So the candida will actually make your child prefer sweet foods like sugary foods or just refined carbohydrates. So white rice, white pasta, white bread. And um, we can address that through various different probiotics and stuff. Then sensory issues, which is a big deal for lots of kids, which ties back to zinc deficiencies, ties back to parasites, ties back to lots of different things. But the main focus of what we're going to talk about today is actually this skills gap. Um, so Vanessa, you might want to just mute yourself again. Um. Um, we're going to mainly be focusing on the skills gap, which is the major focus for the SOS feeding therapy. Um, and the person whose name is 85415 if you have any questions at any point, just um, unmute yourself and ask them. That's fine. Um, so eating is not automatic. It's not instinctive and it doesn't happen no matter what. So as I mentioned earlier, this um, instinctiveness for eating is only for the first four to six weeks in life. Then from four to six weeks to four to six months, the primitive motor re reflexes are really important for eating. But after six months, those reflexes are go away basically. And that's when you get into um, actually the child has to be able to control 
their movements and control their motor skills to actually be able to eat. So what happens after six months is one of three things. Either children learn to eat, which is great. Then there's some children that learn not to eat. And then there's some children that kind of have a half-assed attempt at it and kind of sort of learn to eat. And that's why eight months is a time when lots of families enroll in feeding therapy because they've moved from um, having just breast or bottle on to having solids at about six months. And they struggle for about two months trying to get their child to eat. And then by eight months, it's kind of, they hit the wall and it's crisis time because their child's not eating. And that's because they've learned not to eat or kind of not really learned to eat. So these are the sorts of issues that we're talking about when we talk about skills and there being a skills gap. So it's the oral motor skills. So it's all to do with moving your mouth and moving your tongue and moving your jaw. So at four to six months, your jaw anatomy changes, your reflex changes, your tongue tip lateralization changes and rotary chewing. So we'll talk about those. So from an anatomy point of view, your mandible, which is your jaw bone, moves. Um, and it goes forward, then your tongue doesn't fill your mouth anymore. So for little babies, their tongue actually fills their mouth. So whenever you're breastfeeding, it's really easy for them to suck because their tongue is taking up all the room, but that changes at four to six months. And they actually have to use their tongue to get the same compression to suck. Um, and then their reflexes go away at the same time. So there's a lot happening in this four to six month period. Tongue tip lateralization is uh, <laughs> your, your child's ability to go from left to right with their tongue. Uh, uh, uh. And it was only when I learned about feeding therapy that I realized that's what rusks are for. So hard rusks are a common thing to give babies. And that's actually because it helps with their tongue tip lateralization. Because whenever you put something in your mouth, like at the dentist, if they put something in your mouth, your tongue actually comes over to it, which is why your tongue gets sucked away by the suction at the dentist all the time, because your tongue's happily over here, and someone sticks someone in your mouth, and your tongue goes, Yo! and comes straight over. So that's tongue tip lateralization. And some kids don't do that very well, so they can't actually move their tongue from left to right. And try to eat without moving your tongue from left to right, because it's really, really hard. And you actually need to get food onto your molars, so your big fat teeth at the back, so you can chew. And if you can't move your tongue from side to side very well, you can't move your food, food onto your molars. So you end up swallowing unchewed food, which leads to gagging and vomiting and um, choking incidents, which um, all compounds to being feeding issues. And then there's rotary chewing. So that was <laughs> really hard to demonstrate these things and talk it on time, but that's when your mouth goes around and that's how you chew real meat. So I'm sure for some of you guys, if you have a, a picky eater or a problem eater, the only meat that they eat is McDonald's chicken nuggets. And that's because that meat has been pre-chewed. So it's been chopped up in a big mincer and then stuck together with gums and you can basically suck it apart. You don't need to have that rotary chewing. So that's another skill that children need to learn to be able to actually eat successfully. Then other things that happen from a developmental point of view are from 12 to 14 months, children's flavor perception changes. And something I hear all the time is that, oh my God, my child was brilliant from like six to 12 months. They ate everything that was put in front of them. And then at 12 months, they just stopped. It's because their perception of flavor changes around that time. And then again, from the age one and a half to about three, um, children become aware that they are their own person. They're not an extension of their mum, and they want to form their own opinions. And um, that leads to them wanting to control what they eat and not just eating what their mum is providing them anymore. And that's something that leads to food jags, which we'll talk about in greater detail in a little while. And from a, a brain perspective, they, they move into this magical thinking stage of child development where it's all about 
imagination like fairies and and all those sorts of things so away from just the the action of eating into this kind of dreamland <laughs> then again from five to seven years they shift into a different stage of development of logical thinking which again makes them want to food jag and from nine to eleven they move into abstract thoughts so that can be another problem and every time your child moves from one cognitive stage to the next they regress with their sensory functioning and um, my son is five and a half and he's just started to because he's just started school so he's moving into logical thinking and you can see that's really affecting his food choices and it's making him not want to eat the foods that he has eaten his whole life which is really interesting to observe and really frustrating to deal with <laughs> um all right so what is the difference between a picky eater and a problem feeder so i've split it into two columns so we can see the differences so picky eaters will have a smaller range of food than other children but they'll still eat about more than 30 foods and it's a really useful exercise actually after this to actually write down all the foods that your child will eat. So all the vegetables or fruit that they'll eat, all the protein sources that they will eat and all the starches that they will eat. And that will, it gives you a great starting point of where you are. So whenever you work through a lot of these things, if you do the same exercise in a month's time, hopefully you'll have been able to grow the lists of foods in those columns. So problem feeders have a restricted range of foods um, compared to picky eaters. When picky eaters eat too much of the one food, so say Vegemite on toast every day, they, everybody eventually will burn out on Vegemite and toast every day. For a picky eater, they'll get over that and about two weeks later, they'll be able to eat Vegemite on toast again. But for problem feeders, they won't ever come back to Vegemite on toast. And I see this with children with autism. So they will only eat, um, say, Dawn, ham on Baker's Delight, white bread, and that's all they'll eat for months and months and months. And then one day they'll say, no, we're not eating, I'm not eating that anymore. And they will never eat it again. They won't just be able to take a break and come back to it. They'll never eat it, and that's a problem. A picky eater will be able to have a food on the plate, um, and he can look at it. But with a problem feeder, they will not even be able to see, be in the same room. They will just have a complete meltdown if that food is in their sort of uh, area. And a picky eater will eat more than one food from most food texture groups or nutrition groups, whereas a problem feeder will infuse entire categories. So a problem feeder will maybe not eat any mushy food, so no porridge, no risotto, um, nothing like that or maybe they won't eat any crunchy food so no apple no crackers whereas picky eaters might eat you know jats crackers but not a different sort of cracker um picky eaters are it's an easier thing to fix so if you go through about 15 to 25 small steps you will get a picky eater to add new foods but with the problem feeders it can take more than 25 steps which means even 15 to 25 steps takes quite a lot of um, focus and persistence, but at least it's not too bad. With the problem feeders, you can be in that for a year trying to get up you know, to the 40 steps to getting them to eat a new food. A picky eater will eat with the family, but maybe not eat the same foods, whereas a problem feeder won't even be able to eat with their family. They might eat um, alone and just eat different foods. So maybe most of the families at the dinner table eating and then the problem feeders down watching the TV with his little snack. And this is um, a picky eater will kind of come and go. Sometimes parents might say they're picky, whereas with a problem eater, they will always say, this is a problem, this is a picky child. So I kind of touched about this before, but these are the time points in children's life when issues can occur and it's to do with developmental shifts and changes in skills so at four to six months um, they need to learn about sensory tolerance and exploration so that's when they're putting stuff in their mouth 
um, if your child never mouths stuff and never put them in their mouth, then they're missing out on this sensory tolerance. At about a year, they've got the learning the tongue tip lateralization, then moving on to rotary chewing at this age. And then, so for my son's case, five and a half, it's really, it's a positive mindset. He doesn't have a skills gap. He has no problem rotary chewing or moving his tongue or with sensory issues. He's just um, going through a phase. <laughs> um, so children who have identified or unidentified physical issues often don't manage those transitions. Um, low muscle tone is a big one because lots of what we're talking about is actually to do with muscle and control. So a child with low muscle tone will not be able to learn the um, tongue lateralization or the rotary chewing without sort of actually being taught it, whereas most children will pick it up, they will have to be taught it. So ways, um, what to do is to have a family mealtime structure, be a good role model, and don't allow your child to food jag. And we're gonna talk about those things in more detail. But very important in this is to role model because children learn by watching you. And so you need to, you know, really sit down and go, um, I'm eating my mm, whatever and like chew and then they'll try and do it. So all those things about role modeling. And of course, if you're a fussy eater yourself, um, then that's going to, they're going to learn from that as well. I've just thrown in this slide about the psychology of eating because it explains why we do it in the way that we do the feeding therapy. So if a child eats and you go, yay, and praise them, they're going to eat more. If a child eats, so if they eat um, a bite of a meatball, and then you take a bite of your meatball and go, oh, look, mommy bites too. And then that's going to help them increase more. If a child says, no, I'm not eating. And then you're going, oh, no, you have to eat. You have to eat. You have to eat. It's just going to get worse. They're going to refuse more. Um, other things that can happen is if a child eats and then they choke, that's going to obviously stop them wanting to eat because they're actually scared. If a child eats and they get yelled at, that's going to eat, make them eat less. Or if they eat and they scrape their face. So what I mean by these two things is if your child eats and you hate mess, so you're sitting there with the face cloth every time they take a bite. This is very important when children are just starting solids. They take a bite off the spoon and then you quickly rub their face with the cloth. And then they take a bite and you rub their face. What that is telling them is that every time they eat, you're going to scrape their face and that's going to make them eat less. And the same thing here, if they eat and if they're eating off the spoon and they spill half of it and you shout at them, that's going to make them not want to eat as well. So these are the general strategies that I was um, sort of alluding to earlier. Um, so first of all, the setup needs to be correct. And this is going to vary greatly with your child's age, their stability, um, their height, all those sorts of things. So they need to be sitting on a chair at a table. For a five-year-old, they might need to sit on um, some sort of booster seat because you want their body to be at right angles. So you want their back to be straight, then their legs to be like that, and then their legs to be down. So no slumping, no legs just dangling in midair um, and not being able to slide around in their seat. So put a no skid mat under their bottom and that keeps them still, stops them sliding around. Give them a foot rest. So you can get one of your creative other halves to build foot rests in our time in isolation and to make sure that they have a stable base to put their feet on. And if they are a bit floppy, they might need um, side support. So some yoga blocks, or we don't really have them anymore, but yellow pages or big textbooks on each size of their thigh to help them stay upright. Little kids need a proper high chair. Um, so if they're very little, they 
should be able to have like a reclining high chair or even what in a, a bouncer seat, something that's going to support them. So the only thing they need to worry about is eating. They don't need to be worrying about keeping their position. Bumbos are not good because put a child in a bumbo and they're all, they're all squished up and that's not good either. So you want them to be able to um, basically sit back and relax while they get fed. Then once they have that stability and they can sit upright, then you move into a high chair. And the high chair should again be very supportive and should have a thing between their legs to stop them sliding down and should have a footrest. So something like the IKEA high chair, which is really easy to clean, is not ideal unless you can build a footrest for it. Imagine yourself sitting in a bar, having a drink, having something to eat, and you're on a big um, bar stool, but there's no footrest on it and your legs are just swinging around. It's really weird and it's really unstable and it's not really good for eating. So that's what your child is feeling if they don't have a footrest. And then for older children, what is really good is those stoke, stokey, I don't know how to pronounce it, those really rather expensive wooden high chairs because they're adjustable. As long as you adjust them, because then your child has the footrest, they have the support and it grows with them. So if you invest in one of those when your child is about 14 months, they can be in it till they're about six. And they're, that's always gonna help them be in the correct position for eating. Um, so other general treatment strategies are family meals. And one of the really great things about this period in self-isolation is that we're all, well, most of us are more able to have family meals than ever before. And I have an article on my website actually about family meals and how important they are because they, children that eat meals as a family automatically eat more fruits and vegetables and drink less soft drink and their IQ is higher. <laughs> so that's a great investment in your child's future. And we want to model good eating behaviors in that. Um, so if your husband doesn't like his vegetables, he needs to be trained as well, that he has to learn to eat a wide range of food and enjoy it, not just that, oh, mommy is making me eat this. Talk about the food. So talk about the broccoli, where it came from, what it looks like, what it tastes like. And what I was talking about earlier, really over-exaggerate the movements to show your child what's happening in your mouth that you're having to chew and then imitate them and just get into that sort of back and forth. The same um, when you're trying to teach your little kids anything and you do that sort of back and forth imitation, that's what you want to do with eating. But the child's not the focus. So we're not all sitting around the table looking at this child going, my God, what's he gonna eat today? So it's about um, you know, having a family meal, not, um, getting too stressed out about things, just enjoying the food and making all these exaggerated movements. Um, involve your child. So even little-ish childs can help tear lettuce or you know, set the table even or arrange stuff in a bowl. Um, older children can chop things. So even from about the age of four or five, you can teach them how to use a knife properly and cut up some soft vegetables get them involved in meal planning. Um, the more you involve them, so it's something that they're doing, not something that's being done to them, the more that you're going to get them on board. Uh, don't punish your child at, the me at meals. And I've observed this in the past where one very bright little boy knew that if he acted out at the start of a meal, he would get sent to his room. And guess what? without doubt within the first two minutes of sitting down, he had done something wrong and got sent to his meal every single time, which is great. He didn't have to eat anything. So children are smart and if they don't want to do something, they'll find a way. So don't get into the habit of um, sending your child to the room or to the naughty corner for bad behavior at the meal time. Um, and the child needs to stay at the table at all times. 
Um, something that you can do quite easily is buy a place map that signifies this is eating time. Especially now, if it's like my family, we're doing our homework around the table, we're doing Play-Doh around the table, everything's happening at the one table. So it's really hard for a child to know, is it eating time? Is it, you know, Play-Doh time? Is it coloring in time? So get placemats, just plain black placemats. You can get them in Kmart, but you probably don't want to go to Kmart right now. They do home delivery, so you could get delivered, or you can make some one from, um, just some cloth that you have around the house, anything, but it just needs to be plain, not a really busy cloth. Um, and follow a schedule. So children need to eat every two and a half to three hours. So they definitely don't need to graze because grazing is very bad for your teeth, for your gut, for everything. But they need to eat really frequently. And if you leave it too long, then they get beside themselves with hunger and then they just can't do anything. They can't develop the skills that they need to do because they're just so starving. So work out a schedule for you and your family and make sure that every two and a half to three hours your child is getting fed. So if they're having breakfast at seven, then they need morning tea at half nine and they need lunch at 12. Then they need afternoon tea at half two, dinner at five, and maybe even a snack before bed. Children cannot get by on three meals a day. Adults definitely can, but some can't. <laughs> I can't. Um, but definitely you need to get them to eat regularly. And that's, if your child is younger and still breastfeeding through the night, that's a really important thing to remember as well, that you need to offer them solid foods every two and a half to three hours during the day so they get their needs met. Okay, so these family meals that are all so important. This is the process of getting everybody um, eating family meals. So step one is the warning. So right, <laughs> that's kind of a harsh way to put it, the warning, but you wanna say, right, five minutes time, we're gonna sit down, we're having dinner. So that Duplo house that you're building right now, finish what you need to do, because in five minutes you're gonna have to put it down. And then step two, is you do a transition. So you go and wash your hands. Never has there been more focus in our lives than now on washing hands, but um, 20 seconds with soap and water. If your child won't do that, then what you can do is squirt the soap into the sink, fill up the sink and get them to play with the bubbles for a little while, which is good because it gives them some sensory input as well. And then just give them like a little rub around in the water and then dry them. Uh, and then we all sit down at the table with an empty plate. And this is one of the big features of SOS feeding therapy is the family style serving. So we all sit down at the table with an empty plate and the serving bowls go on the table. So you might have a, a bowl that has bolognese in it. You might have a bowl that has pasta in it. And you might have a bowl that has some salad in it. And everybody gets served a little bit of each of those foods and put on their plate. So if your child can't tolerate the bolognese being on the plate or the salad being on the plate, then you put a different little plate in the middle of the table and that's the learning plate. And that food that they won't have on their plate goes on to the learning plate. And then we eat our food. We might talk about what's on the learning plate. Oh, look at that tomato. How many seeds are in that? Oh my God. Or that tomato would make a really good clown nose too, wouldn't it? So you talk about the food, there's no pressure to eat the food. Um, and then at the end of the meal, the learning plate just goes away. Personally, I would, as a parent, I would eat that food myself later. I wouldn't throw it away, but that's up to you. And then at the end of the meal, which is only about 20 to 30 minutes, we clean up. So everybody participates in this. They bring their dishes to the sink. Whatever food is left on their plate, they either have to scrape into the bin. Or if, they, if they can't even scrape it, then they blow it off into the bin. Um, but that just that's a really important stage as well, is the, the cleanup. Um, and these things, you might think these will never work or this all sounds too simple, but this is the groundwork. Um, and it's like... If you've got 50 kilos to lose, you might think that just cutting out one latte a day 
won't help and it won't help in one day or one week or one month but if you cut out one latte a day for a year it will help so problems don't get solved overnight problems get solved by consistency and persistence so and now is the good time to do that um so with some families you might only want to have three foods at a time that might be as much as anyone can tolerate which means you might need to have two courses so if you really want them to have some i don't know some sauerkraut as well which i highly recommend for everybody and um, they could have that as their little starter in little egg cup um, every meal should have one protein one starch or one fruit or veg preferably a veg because vegetables have more nutrients and less sugar and then one starch so my favorite starches would be things like sweet potato and um, even potato my less favorite starches would be things like rice or pasta because they're just not very nutrient dense and then one protein so if you're a vegetarian family it might be falafel or a, um, some sort of lentil burger if you eat meat and fish then it could be a bit of chicken a bit of fish um, whatever present food in manageable bites so not a big um, like lamb chop or something something that they can handle and this rule of thumb, it is really just a rule of thumb, but um, because children have, and adults have vastly different appetites. So you want to be having about one tablespoon of each of those foods per year of age. So for a three-year-old, they might have one tablespoon of the starch, one tablespoon of the vegetable, and one tablespoon of the protein. But that's, to me, that's quite, um, that's low-balling it a lot. Some kids will eat a lot more than that. I limit the snacks to 30 minutes so I would actually set a timer on your iPhone when you sit down to when you finish that's 30 minutes because otherwise as I'm sure you're aware the meals can drag out for hours and just we need to manage our stress at this time and that's very stressful having meals going for hours all right so food jags the much awaited information about food jags so Food jags are when children want to eat the exact same food prepared in the exact same way at every single meal. And you might think, well, that's good because my child's eating. And that is great that your child's eating. But as I mentioned earlier, they will get burned out. So they will eat those foods every meal, every snack, every day for weeks or months, and then they'll stop and they will never eat them again. And then what do you do? Because that was it. That was all there was. Um, so how to prevent them? You really want to offer um, any food only every other day. And if you consider what I mentioned before, that children should be eating every three hours, so four to six meals a day, and they need to get offered a protein, starch, and vegetable at every meal. That means to get to avoid food jags, to get through two full days, they need to have in their repertoire 10 different proteins, 10 different starches, and 10 different veggies. So when you go back later to do that exercise about writing down what protein, starches and veggies your child does eat, see if you've got 10 or not. Um, and if they don't, well then you need to start working on the food jags in this way. So the first thing you do is you change the shape. So say they're only eating Vegemite on white toast you could um, cut the toast, so the, just cut the corners off the toast or something odd like that. So it has to be a change that they will notice, but they won't freak out about. And if you do the change too big, then obviously you push them into refusing that food as well, and you don't have a backup plan yet. If they only eat um, spaghetti with olive oil, then maybe change to fettuccine with olive oil. So slightly different shape of pasta, but will taste exactly the same. The next sort of change you could make, and these are, you build up to these. So shape doesn't affect anything except in their mind. So it's a pretty safe place to start. So color, say they'll only eat um, tasty cheese. 
you could move to just a slightly different color of tasty cheese or cheddar cheese or red Leicester might be a bit too much, but just change the color very slightly. And then the next step is changing the taste. And then the next step is changing the texture. So these get progressively harder. And it has to be, as I said, small enough that they won't freak out, but big enough that they will actually notice. Because children need to be challenged from a sensory point of view. They need, if they're just eating the same food every day, their sensory system is not getting challenged at all. And it needs to get little challenges so it can adapt. So yes, just a noticeable difference. And that's something to work on straight away. So SOS feeding therapy, when is it appropriate? Um, so these are situations when you really want to focus on doing some feeding therapy. So if their weight gain is poor and has been poor for a while, or if they've even lost weight, um, if they just look at a food and they gag or they choke, which is really common, if they vomit a lot at the thought of food or when they eat food, if the food goes up their nose, or if they've had a traumatic choking incident. One thing I would say on choking is that never feed your child in a car because you can't do anything about it if anything happens. So the, the, a great way to avoid choking is never eat in a car and always supervise your child eating up until they're about five. Somebody needs to be with them all the time when they're eating. Um, other reasons why feeding therapy might be the right way to go is if they've got um, eating and breathing issues with ongoing respiratory issues. So where they're um, aspirating food into their lungs. When you haven't been able to transition off the purees by 10 months. And if they're not able to eat normal tail food by 12 months, I went back to work with each of my three kids. Um, well, if one of them, he was, I think nine months, but the other two were about 10 and a half, 11 months. And I was working full time and there was no way I was cooking two different meals. So I always made sure that I had my kids onto normal family foods by the time they were about 11 or 12 months. So if you've wanted to do that, but couldn't, then you may have an issue. If you haven't got them drinking by a cup, from a cup by 16 months, and if they're not weaned off baby foods by 16 months, those are other sort of red flags. Whoops, I just skipped it. Um, if they avoid foods in the entire food group, so if they avoid all meat, I have one, um, one client who is a vegetarian because she just won't eat any meat. So she's just named herself a vegetarian. Um, so if your child avoids like meat entirely, then that's an issue unless you are a vegetarian or a vegan family who provides healthy food choices to make up for that. If their food range is less than 20 foods and it's decreasing, that's an issue. If it's causing fighting, um, <laughs> it's a bit funny right now when we're all stuck in the same houses all together all day long. You do not want to be fighting at mealtimes. And if the child is difficult for everybody to feed. So if your child eats like a trooper at daycare and won't eat for you, then if you implement those general feeding strategies that we talked about earlier, that will work because they have no skills problem. They just, um, they just don't want to eat for you which is a bummer. So what is SOS feeding therapy? So it basically works on a hierarchy and your child starts at the bottom of the hierarchy and works its way up to the top. So it starts with tolerates, so literally being in the same room as a food, interacts with the food, so it's able to um, like push it along, like push a tomato along with a fork. It's so able to smell the food, then touch the food, taste the food, and then eat the food. And even with touch, that's broken down where you know they might be able to put it on their fingertips, then they might be able to put it on the top of their head, maybe able to get it on their cheek, eventually on their lip, and then it leads on to taste. And you think, well, what on earth do I want to teach my child to put food on their head for? But 
you have to remember if your child has missed out on learning to eat when they're six months, then you need to go back to that developmental stage. And that's if you feed a six month avocado, they'll have it through their hair, they'll have it in their eyebrows, they'll have it up their nose because they've been exploring it in all those ways. So you have to go back to that exploratory stage. And if you're a clean freak, then you're going to have to deal with that. Um, and just get ready with the hose, toes and down afters because that's important to go back to the developmental stage where they kind of dropped off to get them up to the eating stage. And the SOS, um, let's go back. SOS feeding therapy, what I do is I build a program based on the foods that the children will eat and then with a view to broadening that range to get I work out a hierarchy for the foods, for different tastes and textures to get them eating a wide range of food. And that's specific to each child. That's not like a template because we need to work with what the child is eating to start off with. Um, so this is kind of the philosophy of SOS feeding therapy. It's those myths that we talked about, they don't help. Um, they don't benefit the family in any way and we need to just get past those myths. The systematic desensitization is the best approach. So starting with the tolerating and getting up to the eating in a very slow and gentle way. And we use a relaxation response, which basically just means playing with the food. If your child is really stressed when you're trying to get them to eat, it's gonna decrease their appetite and it's not really gonna get them to eat. But if you get them to relax and play with the food and move up those steps to eating very, very gradually, that's systematic desensitization. Normal development of feeding gives us the best blueprint for feeding treatment. So that's what I was saying about going back to the developmental stage where they stopped eating and then working from there, that's, that's the normal way. Or if your child never had rusks and now can't do the tongue tip lateralization, you need to go back to that stage and learn that skill. And the food hierarchies, um, that's how you build up and you progress. Um, so I said at the start, I would just explain the difference between SOS feeding therapy and other feeding therapies. So SOS feeding therapy is all about this positive reinforcement. There are some feeding therapies that are about negative reinforcement. So with positive reinforcement, it takes time. So that's a major con that this is not an overnight success. You won't do feeding therapy with me on a Tuesday and on a Thursday, your child's eating the same foods as you. So that is a drawback. I'll just be honest about that. Um, but it does create lasting behavior. So once you go through a program and you make the changes and your child takes new foods, that will last and that will set them up for life with a broader range of foods. It's how children normally learn to eat. So they don't turn around at six months and have a steak and chips. <laughs> they build up gradually. So you can't expect a five-year-old with feeding problems to crack it in two months because a six-month-old doesn't learn to eat in two months. They learn to eat over 18 months. It builds intrinsic motivation. So it makes them want to eat, not to be having to be encouraged to eat every meal. It's fun. And it's a whole family thing. We all need more family activities in our lives. Negative reinforcements can teach children to swallow liquids and puree quickly. So there are some situations where this is essential. So if your child has restricted their food so much that they need to get in a G tube, so like that's they either get an NG tube up their nose or get surgery to put a tube into their tummy next week or else they're going to be in danger, then you need to do the negative reinforcement. Well, not you personally, but you, that's what you should enroll in because that gets results really, really quickly. But the bad thing about that is this high recidivism rate. So it means they will ultimate, ultimately regress. So you'll get them to put on weight because they're being um, negatively reinforced to eat these foods and to swallow stuff. But once the pressure comes off after a month or two, then they'll go back to their old weighting ways because they haven't learned the skills. They've been, weight has been put on, but they haven't learned the skills. They still don't know how to eat. 
and without that constant external motivation, they won't eat. Um, it causes their adrenaline to go really high, which makes them less hungry and not want to eat. And it's, um, it's not, they're not taking part in it. It's something that's being done to, that, to, done to the child, not something that the child is participating in. So um, I'm doing well for time, which is good. Um, so because I'm a nutritionist and a feeding therapist, I can combine those two skill sets to get the best results. If you, um, most feeding therapists are either occupational therapists or speech therapists. And I do work with them when necessary on building some of these skills. But I also work on correcting nutritional deficiencies. So the zinc um, probiotics, if they have other deficiencies, which I've evaluated, I improve on, I work on improving their gut health. And I make healthy food choices for the food therapy. So for instance, dissolvable foods form a big part in food therapy um, because you don't need many skills to that, but it still gets the child tasting new flavors and exploring new foods. Lots of feeding therapists would use um, Cheetos, Cheez-Its, some of those things for that. But I use things like freeze-dried fruit, which also dissolve in your mouth, um, but are have a good nutritional profile. Oops. Um, so if you wanted to do more with this, um, because it's, it's a good time and a bad time to do this, it's a good time because we are at home with our child's children for every single meal and snack, which is good for doing this. But of course, if you have lost your job because of coronavirus, um, you won't have the funds to do this. So that's something for you to decide. But if you did want to go further with this, the first step is just to do an assessment. So I go through the health history for the child going back to pregnancy for mum. I assess the skill level of the child, to see what they're missing out on. I look at their nutrition status, their gut health, um, all aspects of the feeding to do with the environment, to do with the parents, to do with the children. And then based on that, I put together a report and recommendations on and a plan for you to follow at home to do all this groundwork that needs to be done. At this point in time, I'm not doing feeding therapy for obvious reasons. Um, it's really hard to do feeding therapy via Zoom because it does rely on me interacting with the child. There is a way to do it, like if you have ear pods, um, I can give you, tell you what to do with the child so they can't hear it. But that's quite, um, it's reasonably difficult to do. So at this point in time, I'm not doing that. And there's a link here, um, which I can email out to you all, where you can book in to do a feeding ass assessment. Um, back to the funding. If you have NDIS funding for your child, there are a couple of categories that you can claim under for feeding therapy. Um, private health at the minute do not cover telehealth, but they will do. They're working on it. So hopefully in the next week or so, if you have private health cover that covers me for nutrition, you will be able to get funding for that. These are the various different ways to get in touch with me or stay connected with me. So that's my phone number, my email address. My website has lots of great recipes on it and lots of great articles as well. So I encourage you to have a dig around there. And then I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram as well. So you can follow me there. So that's all my lecture. I know that was kind of a lot to watch, but you will, if, if I recorded this properly, I'll email mail it out to you all next week. Um, but what questions do we have? <laughs>